Yeah. Hey guys, David Robinson here. Welcome to the Apartment Investing Journey. Super excited about my guest today. Um, he is someone who I've been listening to for a long time and recently just connected on a, on a deeper level. Uh, and he's a mentor of mine and someone that I've been following and, and I look at as someone who, um, in our space, uh, sometimes we are very well in tune with the boots on the ground investing in multifamily, uh, whether it be duplex, fourplex, small uh, apartment buildings, or even large syndications. But there's a whole nother level of understanding economics. And Hunter Thompson is one of those guys that I feel like has a grasp of it all and is very well-rounded. And so I'm super stoked to have him on uh, the show today to chat with us. Hunter, welcome. Appreciate it. Hey, that's a really kind introduction. I appreciate it and honor to be on the program and looking forward to the conversation. Well, um, our podcast is all about the journey. And so what I would like to hear, if you don't mind backing up and just telling us your story, how, what'd you do before you got into real estate and how did you make this transition into this space? Yeah, I like the opportunity to kind of talk about it because I think that you start to hear, you know, anyone that has any level of success, it starts to feel like sometimes like people didn't have to go through much. They just snapped into it and just started crushing it and just, you know, always were on this awesome level. And so the show like this provides an opportunity for other people to say, wow, he can do it. I can do it. And the more diverse backgrounds, the more interesting the characters are the more likely that someone's going to say, okay, so like if that personality can do it and that personality can do it and those unique abilities and those unique skill sets can do it, then maybe my skill set fits into this. And if you're listening to this and you're contemplating that, the answer is absolutely yes. It's not easy and it's a lot of hard work and it's, you know, multifamily is a lucrative business, so it attracts the best of the best. But trust me, I've rubbed shoulders with the best of the best and they're all different. They all have different skills. So just keep at it. We'll talk about kind of my story as well. So, you know, I have always been an entrepreneur um, from a very early age. As soon as I understood what money was and that you could make it if you kind of added some value or understood market dynamics, you know, when I was five years old, we lived very close to a very popular concert venue. And my mom used to let me sell parking spaces in the backyard for like five or 10 bucks. And she would take a percentage of the cut, of course, just to show me what it means to own versus to rent. But, um, you know, as soon as I realized that was possible, I mean, I remember making my first hundred dollars and being like, this is powerful, like three figures. What's up? You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, that was always something that I was really drawn to trying to find unique niches. And as I got older, those niches got more complicated. Um, one that I really loved and I think I learned a lot from was I lived in Tennessee uh, when I was growing up, Memphis, Tennessee, and about three and a half hours away from Tennessee, um, there was a poker player who played, it was an accountant, uh, excuse me, I should say he was an accountant that played an online poker game that was a $17 buy-in. He won that tournament, which got him entran an entrance into a $200 buy-in. He won that tournament, which got him an entrance into the World Series of Poker, which is typically a $10,000 buy-in. And then he won the World Series of Poker and won a million dollars. And funny enough, his name was actually Chris Moneymaker. Like not to do with poker. That was just literally his name. And the combination of all of this, especially with that name, created something that's known in the poker business as the poker boom hundreds of millions of dollars rushed into the world of online poker because this guy was just a random person that wasn't focused on poker, but was, you know, a smart guy who's an accountant and he won a million dollars. It's just the clearest story for, you know, <laughs> it's the American dream. And I was a college student when this was starting to happen or high school and then transitioning into college. And it created an opportunity where if you took it seriously, if you got a coach, if you learned something really complicated through online tutorials and online coaching programs, you could make five, 10, 20, 30 grand a month um, consistently without having a boss. And that was extremely compelling to me for two reasons. Number one, it was pretty lucrative for a college summer job. Number two, there was no boss involved. And also just the game of poker is a very intellectual game. And looking at things on a risk adjusted basis is a skill that crossed over very well with my next profession. But, you know, long story short, the way that that ended was the, the real estate crisis happened right after online poker was basically banned. And luckily, I had fell out of love with online poker 
in live poker and was kind of sitting on the sidelines, the real estate crisis took place. And so my first investments were from proceeds from, you know, that online career and which wasn't really, you know, I would do it in increments of three months time during the summer. So that's really how I got introduced to the real estate market. I saw a massive collapse in the, in the prices and valuations and figured it was a good time to focus my efforts away and into the world of syndications. Interesting. So how were you exposed to syndications? At what point do you remember a sort of a, a tipping point or a point where you read a book or heard an article or heard a podcast that sort of exposed your mind to it? So I was very fortunate in terms of that story, the timing of that story for ways that are obviously apparent in terms of the valuation, but some ways that aren't as apparent. So I moved to California when the real estate crisis happened, unrelated to the crisis, just because I was felt compelled to move to the West Coast and was drawn to the fact that there was a lot of money and a lot of economic activity. And so when the crisis happened, it was very pronounced in California. And so knowing that I wanted to get into real estate, knowing that I was interested in taking advantage of the price deflation, I started going to networking events and the networking events were occupied by some very savvy, very sophisticated investors that were able to overcome that storm. And especially in California, that's really saying something. So networking events that used to have 500 people now had 10 people. And the mood was very somber and all the rah, rah, rah that was going on at those you know, $50,000, $100,000 coaching programs was eliminated. And so I basically built my investment thesis built on some very powerful, very influential, very sophisticated individuals that had, so I was able to leapfrog a lot of the strategies that people typically start out with, you know, buying a single family house, renting it out or getting a duplex, renting it out the one that's vacant. And, um, you know, I feel very fortunate both in terms of market timing, but also in terms of identifying an opportunity and a, an algorithm through which to view that opportunity. Yeah. And so I think this is a great point, uh, a great place to sort of segue into telling us a little bit about your business and what it is today. What do you do inside of this syndication or, or even investing space? Sure. So, you know, when I first started investing and was exposed to the world of syndications, which for those of you listening, I'm sure most people are familiar, but let's say pooling investors together to purchase high quality assets, typically five, 15, $50 million properties. And I felt compelled to invest like this because I realized that if I could find best in class operators that are in charge of overseeing the business implementation of different strategies, such as you know, self storage, multifamily, mobile home park, office, retail, et cetera, I could defer to their expertise, their time, their energy, their access to capital. And if they were only taking, let's say 30% of the proceeds, the math was very compelling to me. You know, if you can find someone that's best in class, that you know, I could spend 10 years doing just multifamily just in Texas, and I may not be half as good as some of them. And so the math was there, and it didn't even have to do with my time, right? My time was not a function of this. So I started investing like this. And as the world of syndication started to get more popular, I realized there was an opportunity for a business to be created. Basically, I had built a Rolodex of very high caliber sponsors and started to curate investors and realized I wanted to play the role of investor relations branch of some of these operating partners that didn't really like interfacing with investors. And so, you know, you've read my book, you know, I started my company after developing my own track record with my own capital and some immediate family capital and went out to the marketplace and was really shocked with the lack of reception because it's hard to convince someone who's not investing in real estate to invest in some of these unique niches that you and I are so familiar with and think are so popular. They're not in the grand scheme of things. So my business basically acts as a capital arm. And you know, I went from failing to raise half a million dollars to frequently I'll get an email with someone that's willing to invest a quarter million or $300,000 um, just because of all the work that we put in the reputation that I have and the reputation that the firm has. I appreciate you walking us through that. I, I want to dive into, maybe if you can, um, and, and Hunter has a great book, uh, Raising Capital for Real Estate. 
And uh, it's a killer book. It's right. on audiobook as well. Boom, there it is. Right. Um, he goes into an incredible amount of detail in the process that he used to build his business. Um, but in the, in the book, he, he talks about uh, his first foray into raising capital from outside investors. And Hunter, maybe if you can dive into that, um, that story real quick. And then I want to talk about some of the challenges uh, that, well, I, I'd like to talk about how you educate passive investors and help them to feel comfortable with this process of syndication that, as you have explained, is foreign to a lot of different people. Yeah. So I found the mobile home park business early in my career very compelling. You know, the combination of 10,000 baby boomers hitting the age of retirement every single day, very minimum, very little of them have savings. And the fact that there's no real economic incentive to develop affordable units, it's very challenging to do that without some sort of government subsidy. And the fact that every single year, there are less and less mobile home parks in the United States. Most of the mobile home parks in the US were developed in the 1970s as kind of a, a veterans housing program. And since then, the reputation that they have has deteriorated and cities are very much incentivized to remove them and replace them with higher density housing. So I found this reality uh, really compelling, and it doesn't make the totality of the thesis, but it does present some very clear tailwinds. And so started researching the topic, started conducting due diligence on operating partners, and then started investing significantly. And so by 2013 or so, I had developed a track record for my own personal portfolio and established a strategic partnership that was a very, very sophisticated and, and a high caliber operator. And decided, okay, I'm going to create a fund, pull investors together, use my track record to show this has been working, and I'll create my first half million dollar fund. And it actually agreed with the operating partner, you know, I'm confident we'll be able to make this work. And they said, okay, good. But if you're unable to, you know, invest at least a half a million dollars, we can't give your entity favorable terms. And I said, that's not a problem. So I got in a room full of 30 people through doing some marketing, friends and family, plus their plus ones, plus two, and you know, 30 accredited investors. So basically a minimum of $30 million in the room, I'd say, and gave this presentation as confident as I'm speaking to you now. And it was a 30 minute presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I handed out a piece of paper so that people could write on their paper how much they wanted to invest. And then they could turn over to be private and then turn it into me. And the presentation went very well. There was great questions that were being asked about when I can get my money back and how long you've been doing this and have you been on site to see any of these properties? And I was just very well prepared for all of that. And after the presentation, I counted up all the papers and the total number of dollars invested was zero, not a dollar. And I mean, everyone has their own streaks and weaknesses, right? As an entrepreneur. And so for me, the financial element of this was not as consequential, but the true embarrassment of just going back to friends that were thinking, you know, texting me, how'd it go? You know, I'm so excited to accelerate. I wonder if it was 1 million or 2 million. And just to say, actually, it's a total goose egg. Like, it's very hard for me to overcome that. And so I took about six months, probably two weeks to cry, six months to <laughs> contemplate what I wanted to do professionally and realized that. I never wanted to try to convince someone to invest with me again. It's not scalable. It's not reasonable. It's not something that someone's going to do in a 30 minute presentation to go, Oh, I'm a 50 year old person. I've been making a $300,000 a year for the last 20 years of my life. And my stock market has been doing fine over the long term. Now someone far younger than me is going to convince me to do something in real estate, let alone the mobile home park business in 30 minutes. And so I have dedicated over the last decade all of my attention to creating an infrastructure that attracts people that are already interested in these topics, that educates them through a combination of interviews and articles and podcasts, and just creates a much more streamlined approach. So by the time that I get on the phone with them, they're already well aware of all the intricacies of my own business, my personality, and even the investment itself. It's just a matter of confirming that I'm the type of person that number one is available to take a call and is receptive to, you know, their energy level to, for lack of a better term. And once that conversation is done, the likelihood that they'll move forward is far greater. And so that's what the book is all about. And that's what my business is all about. 
unfortunately or fortunately, I did document it in great detail. So it's like the entire playbook of my life's work. And I figured if I give it away, we'll probably do what my real goal is, which to help people get money out of the stock market into their own control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to have a big impact. And I think it's going to open up the doors for a lot of people to get into this space. Uh, you're, you're a trailblazer, and you've documented it. it very well. And it helps uh, individuals like me get into this space and, and uh, stand on the sh shoulders of other people that have done great work. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit about the nuances in <clears throat> educating, let's say, first-time investors. Now, granted, you've developed this system and this machine that educates people all along the way. So before you even got to get on a call with them, they're probably more educated than the average person as it relates to these types of investments. That being said, based upon early experience, maybe when you didn't have this type of you know uh, educational system in place, what are what are some of the the challenges uh, that you see first time investors uh, having to overcome in order to get in this space? Well, I mean, the first one, the most important, is from an investor's perspective, it's the distinction between active versus passive, and I think that that's a conversation. My goodness, sometimes I don't even like talking about how compelling the passive approach is because it's like. It's so compelling. I don't understand why everyone's not doing it, at least significantly. Um, and even operators that actively own real estate, I think should be doing more in their own per personal portfolio. But the big distinction is, are you willing to exchange control as an active owner where you can decide when the property is purchased, you can decide when to raise rent, you can decide when to sell the asset, you can decide whether to refinance, you can decide whether to complete some capital expenditure and make the property nicer. You got all of that control are you willing to give that up for diversification? And when I say diversification, I think that there's some misconceptions about that because that term refers to far more than what most people think. It is not just the difference between investing in self-storage facilities versus investing in multifamily. It's the difference between timelines, how long are the debt terms, um, what the property manager diversification is, you know, things like what strategies are implementing, even at the property manager level. Let's say that there's one company that really likes to hire retirees who are ex-military people. They make great self-storage managers. Then we have another self-storage operator that operates in a different geographic location that says, we like to hire young up-and-comers that want to grow within the own company. Now, which one of those two strategies sounds better to you? Both sound good. Which one's going to be better? I don't really know. We'll probably figure it out over the next 10 years as the two operating partners compete. But I want to participate in both because both make sense. And by the way, they both could work good for those respective companies. So from a diversification standpoint, you know, asset class, risk profile, time horizon, geographic location, those are all critical. And when you put forth the work to do this, you know, I'm an investor in 35 syndications right now. Um, I sleep like a baby because I know that no matter what happens in terms of the, the market, the regulatory environment, interest rate risk, I can intelligently participate in a variety of different strategies. Man, I love it. Yeah, the diversification uh, and being able to, you know, uh, I talk with a lot of boots on the ground investors, multifamily, looking to buy their, you know, a, a fourplex or a sixplex uh, here. And, and that's a big part of our business uh, is brokerage services here in Utah. Um, and it's, it's sometimes challenging for me to make the argument for them to go and put, you know, $300,000 down on a sixplex when they could diversify, you know, that $300,000 across six syndications in different parts of the country with different factors that will be beneficial for all of those and diversify all across the table. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge in some cases to... Uh, to provide the services for boots on the ground, buying those properties. But there's still a lot of investors who just aren't comfortable in, in, in giving up that control. And I think that's the, the thing that I've noticed most is the control factor that a lot of the investors want to take. Yeah, completely agree. And then, you know, on the other side of that, from a first time capital raiser, the big thing I would say with that is just understanding going back to our previous conversation, the negative interest rate bond market is about $17 trillion. There is an overwhelming glut of people running around trying to search for yield. In Japan, for example, 
bonds have a negative interest rate over a 10 year term, meaning that the likelihood, if the investment performs perfectly, they will lose money. So, you know, listening to podcasts like these, you start to feel like everyone in the world is investing in passive syndications and multifamily is so competitive and this, that, and the other thing compared to what? Not compared to that $7 trillion monster of people that are would be shocked to find out how compelling some of the investments you guys have opportunities are. Just understanding you're the prize and that people want to phone, talk to you because they're looking for that yield. Yeah, love it. Well, look, uh, I want to be careful with your time. Um, I want to start winding down here a little bit. But before we do, I've got three questions I want to ask you. You ready? Let's do it. All of course. Right. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you faced as a passive investor? Not necessarily on raising capital, but as a passive investor, what's the biggest challenge you've faced on your real estate investing journey so far? So, I mean, it does come down to diversification to a large degree, right? So we invested in a retail center that, <clears throat> excuse me, was an absolutely quality operator in a great growing market. And we're very confident we're going to overperform over the long run. We did have some challenges in the early days because there was a really significant hurricane, Harvey, I believe, um, and it immediately coincided with an elevator breaking unrelated to Harvey. And so the elevator alone was about a quarter million dollars and the Harvey damage was about a half a million dollars. Now insurance does cover both of those, but sometimes there can be a lag. So from a passive investor standpoint, I want two things, predictability of outcome. Most of that's generated through cash flow, and I want outsized returns through some sort of value add potential. But the type of investments that I like, I need to have a good solid 50-50 combination of both. And if that cash flow stops for a quarter or two, that can be a little bit of a headache. Now, I mentioned that I was an investor in 35 syndications. So from a true financial planning standpoint, that's not a major hurdle. But the only reason that it's not a major hurdle is because I didn't put my entire portfolio in that one deal. If it was, that would create some huge challenges for me in terms of paying off my expenses, which is the whole goal, you know, what most people refer to as quote financial freedom, that predictability to be able to pay your expenses uh, through your passive cash flow. Yeah. What's the biggest win you've had on your investing journey so far? You know, I could talk about, well, I'll put it this way. I just recently got an email from a one-off deal that was just made me really happy because of the team that was involved. Um, my wife, who has a corporate event planning company, she's over in the other office, by the way, dealing with the 2008 type of situation. As of the recording of this, we're in the middle of uh, the concerns around coronavirus. It's basically illegal to congregate. So her business is pivoting really quickly. Um, she wanted to previously was really focused on seeing if she wanted to get into fixing and flipping houses. And we put up a really cool team together it was a, a broker who I've partnered with many times, a, a contractor and a GC that he had been partners with on an unrelated deal. She did the interior design for the property and we flipped this house in Southern California and I literally got a 48% IRR. So like, that's just unbelievable. But truthfully, it's really about, I had fun working with these people on this project. That's not my typical type of investment, but just you know, seeing her succeed, the house was beautiful, seeing the property come in over projections and everyone from the investor to the interior designer to the GC to my friend who brokered the deal, everyone made money and you know, that's so fun for me to just be able to help people put food on the table, it's awesome. Yeah, that's great. And it's interesting that your biggest win that you mentioned is an active investing deal. <laughs> That's true. Well, I was a passive investor, but yeah, oh, okay. I didn't, All right. you know, I, I basically didn't have you any steered the ship. Anything. Oh, yeah, really? Even the money. Oh, okay. no, yeah. I just paid the money and they said at the end of this nine months, here's your check. All now right. I got to see the inside because of what she was dealing with. Sure. But so yeah, I'll count that as a passive. There we go. All right. Well, look, uh, um, the last question that I have for you is I want, um, I look to you as someone who uh, is very well-rounded, um, in fact, you, I was just, before we got on, I was listening to your podcast with, uh, Richard Duncan, uh, who's a very, um, very smart guy wow. as it relates to global, global economics. Totally. And you, uh, you were holding your own. I hadn't got through the entire thing yet, but, um, a, a very intriguing conversation and that's over on your podcast, uh, Cashflow Connections, correct? That's right. And I appreciate the shout out. It's Cashflow Connections. It's three words, right? So some people get confused, but yes, cash flow is two words. 
Okay. Cash flow connections. And uh, yeah, if you haven't checked out Hunter's uh, podcast, go check that out. Um, but I, I, I look at you as someone that I can turn to, to get a little bit more insight than the average podcast as it relates to syndications on what's going on in the economy. And, and I'm interested in hearing what you think is going to happen over the next handful of months and how you're preparing for what's going on. Yeah. So, I mean, before I even answer that question, I just want to, first of all, thank you for having me on and thank you for the compliment. I will say that whatever you find your strengths are, whatever the concept that Dan Sullivan refers to as unique ability, just absolutely triple down on that and try to outsource or delegate everything else. And so the compliments that you just gave me about being well-rounded and kind of being able to hold my own against a IMF consultant to the IMF um, is a result of me just tripling down on what I love to do, which is take really complicated ideas and synthesize them in a way that makes uh, very sophisticated investors understand them as well as very new investors and bring them up to level of sophistication very quickly. So when I'm on my podcast, it's like me operating in my total unique ability. I'm nowhere near understanding the world of the economy as well as Richard Duncan, but I'm really good at bringing that information out of him, right? And that's what's cool about that interview. Um, I'm sorry, I don't even remember the question. I just wanted to kind of highlight I'm interested. Uh, no, I appreciate that. I'm interested in, in your take on where we're headed and what oh, you're yeah. doing as a passive investor to sort of navigate these rough waters that we're in right now. Cool. So I actually just posted my first article on LinkedIn, which is about our outlook post coronavirus. And I kind of go through the different asset classes. I'll give you a quick summary. If you can, I'll link to my LinkedIn in the show notes page. I'll provide that for you if right. people are interested. But basically, you know, in the short term, we're very bearish. First of all, transaction volume has decreased so much that it's very challenging to establish market dynamics and market pricing. And when we go to investors, we want to be able to present a clear case that we're purchasing an asset that's undervalued based on market. The real question right now is what is market? So that's one thing I'll say, and that's true across multiple different sectors. Um, just really high level, I see the multifamily apartments. The thesis there is very compelling over the long term, but if you're investing in workforce or affordable, the tenant base is going to be hit hard with this. Many of those jobs are not able to be completed over the internet, and many of them don't have much savings for 12 weeks or four weeks of you know, paying rent, for example. Self-storage is a business that we've been very bullish on over the last decade. That asset class so far has not been hit almost at all. It makes a lot of sense. People are not really supposed to be going there much in the first place. And there's the whole recession resistant component where the more likely people are to downsize, the more likely they are to use self storage. With the mobile home park business, similar to multifamily apartments, I will say that the $1,200 check that's likely coming to a lot of these residents due to the CARES Act, that goes a long way in the mobile home park business. You know, that could be three months of rent. And if it's a two adult household, that could be six months of rent. That's nothing to, to scoff at. Now, the retail business, obviously, a lot of businesses are preparing, you know, emotionally and sometimes financially for a recession, meaning, you know, a 25% or a 30% reduction in revenues. This is completely a historic, a 100% fall off is something that no business can accurately prepare for, not for any meaningful amount of time. So there is a lot of forbearance. There's a lot of forgiveness requests that are taking place. But the good news in that sector is that these businesses are struggling, not due to a decline in the demand for their product. Many of these are profitable organizations that are just being paused through government suck shutdowns or about Corona. So I think that lenders who at the end of the day always decide how challenging this is going to be is the banks. They're going to be very flexible if given the liquidity to do so, which is why the federal government has provided the liquidity that it has over the last couple of years, which is ex uh, completely a historic. Um, and then I will talk about just distressed debt. That's a very interesting asset class right now. There's likely going to be a lot of uncertainty in that space in terms of regulatory environments. That uncertainty creates a tremendous opportunity for pricing arbitrage. Last one, and this has kind of been a, a big high-level summary of my whole investment thesis, but the senior living facility is, and that space is so interesting, so complicated, and has a tremendous tailwind of the demographic shifts which are taking place. The risk there is unique. It's not a risk of NOI. 
the rental income in senior living facilities for the most part has been completely unchanged. Those rents are being paid for by savings. Those are being paid for by home equity. Those are being paid for by relatives that are usually making $100,000 or more. The risk there is contagion and potentially passing away of the tenants due to this particular virus. So you have to be very careful about all these asset classes, but I think I probably made a case for why we think we're so excited about some of the ones that we're so focused on. Love it. <clears throat> well, Hunter, it's, a, it's an honor to have you on the show. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. How can our listeners connect with you or reach out to you or learn more about what you have going on? Yeah, I'll also provide that LinkedIn link so that they can have access to that article. And then also um, my investment company is asymcapital.com, A-S-Y-M capital.com. And we tried to give away a free thousand copies of Raising Capital for Real Estate. Those went away much quicker than I could possibly imagine. So we increased it to 5,000. You can get a free copy at raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. All you got to do is pay for the shipping and you get a copy of the book. Okay. Love it. Well, Hunter, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.